And, and now it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting, the commander of the Space Operations Command of the new U.S. Space Force. Space Force. And there he leads uh, the preparation, generation, and sustainment of combat-ready intelligence, cyber, space, and combat support forces. And he also serves as the U.S. Space Force service component to the U.S. Space Command, two different uh, elements there. Now, in the military, we use the phrase or the acronym DG an awful lot. And uh, I've made uh, General Whiting's uh, introduction short because I know he probably appreciates that. But let me just say, uh, I have had the pleasure of working with General Whiting for many years. Uh, and what differentiates him, frankly, when you, when you read his long distinguished bio is the fact that there's a term that the military uses a lot, and that is DG. And that means distinguished graduate. And uh, General Whiting was a distinguished graduate of the United States Air Force Academy with a degree in aeronautical engineering. He was the top graduate and DG of undergraduate space training. He was the DG of squadron officer school. He was the top graduate and DG of Air Command and Staff College. Uh, and I also submit that General Whiting has been a DCG uh, many times. And that I am claiming as the distinguished commander graduate because he has commanded at the squadron, center, wing, combined force, component command, and the 14th Air Force levels uh, in, his, in his career. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, General Whiting and your presentation. Over to you, sir. Hey, thanks, General Radigi. Really appreciate that uh, kind introduction. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and uh, everyone who's with us today. I'm always grateful for the chance to address topics related to space and cyber warfighting capabilities. I just wish we could have done this in person, and I suspect we'll be back to that kind of event soon enough. At least I hope we will. But in the meantime, it's uh, somehow fitting that we're using the results of cyber-related innovation in video teleconferencing to hold a virtual event focused on innovation in cybersecurity or for the purposes of this discussion, more specifically, innovation in cyber warfighting. As I began preparing my remarks for today, I couldn't help but borrow from Shakespeare when thinking that with respect to military cyber operations, what is past is prologue, as the Bard said. We've been conducting military cyber operations for decades, but they are more prominent on our radar screen now for sure. Our weapon systems and vital information are so cyber dependent that they're now widely vulnerable to being held at significant risk by potential adversaries. Accordingly, we view cyber today through a bit of a different lens, although that new lens is the result of all the lessons learned by those who have gone before us. Today, we can speak far more openly than in the past about those cyber operations, how we conduct them, why they're important, and what's at stake in their accomplishment. But decades ago, we were already working on concepts that are in play in today's significantly different strategic environment. Military cyber operations of yesteryear have really set us up well for what we're doing today in America's newest declared warfighting domains, space and cyber. It's a story decades in the making, outlining the evolution of and revolution in military cyber. From operating and maintaining the networks critical to our combat effectiveness, to defending those networks to preserve combat capability, to fighting those networks to expand our combat options. But in the end, we'll see that no matter what we were in the where we were in the timeline of that evolution, it was always about warfighting effects. If, for example, you were beginning an Air Force career three or four decades ago, when I first went to the Air Force Academy, and chose the communications career field, you'd likely be focused on the warfighting role of calm, with the realization that effective warfighting mission accomplishment could not occur without a robust calm backbone. Over the course of the next several decades, 
you will be able to see an evolution from operating to defending to fighting our networks just in the duty titles, functions, and breadth of responsibilities you would have held. You would have started, however, by learning about operating the network. Before long, communications would evolve to command, control, and communications, or C3 as we called it, and you'd be working on enhancing our ability to operate the network. Fast forward a few years, and you might have been assigned as a communications officer at a unit operating a space-focused weapon system, where you would begin to see firsthand the natural space and communications nexus. Eventually, if you remain focused on comms for space-focused weapon systems, you would end up here in Colorado Springs, perhaps working command, control, and communication for NORAD, or the old United States Space Command, or what was Air Force Space Command. You, you all may have heard that many years ago, we used to have a triple-hatted sink here in town. Now, at that point in the evolution of military comms, when the commander-in-chief here in the Springs was wearing three hats, we were still using C3 terminology, and people were focused on military comms being about the need for more bandwidth and protecting that bandwidth in a nuclear environment. In those days, we actually had to defend the need for our Milstar satellite constellation to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. But that changed soon enough. We eventually expanded C3 into C4, adding computers, and subsequently C4I, adding intelligence. The Department of Defense was starting to grasp the advantage of a symbiotic relationship among communications networks, computer systems, space weapon systems, and the intelligence community. At that point, we began shifting the vernacular from calm to cyber and speaking more openly about cyber operations. We introduced concepts like offensive information operations and defensive information operations. It was becoming more apparent that warfighting mission success was based on a foundation in cyber. What is past is prologue indeed. I remember that era here in Colorado Springs. I was the operations at the, pardon me, the operations officer at the 22nd Space Operations Squadron, our satellite control network squadron, a unit utterly dependent on worldwide communications to enable us to talk to our satellites and receive their downlink data from anywhere around the globe. I think General Radigi was the director of command and control systems and the director of communications and information at NORAD US Space Command and Air Force Space Command around that time. He has told the story that one of those triple-hatted commanders-in-chief, what today we call a combatant commander, was General Dick Myers, the future chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In General Myers' first SYNC conference, U.S. Space Command got a task from the then Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Hamry, to develop a computer network defense capability. In short, General Myers and his respective comm staffs had to develop our initial capability to defend the network. General Radigi played a big part in that effort. He helped set up a joint task force or JTF for computer network defense, which a couple of years later became the joint task force for computer network operations or JTF CNO. Eventually aligned to US strategic command, JTF CNO continued to evolve. In 2004, Strategic Command published the Joint Concept of Operations for Gig Network Operations, or the NetOps ConOps. Later, the Secretary of Defense appointed the Director of the Defense Information Services Agency as the Commander JTF GNO. Under that role, these new cyber units eventually became a subunified command and finally a new combatant command known today as United States Cyber Command. With this establishment, we can see the full evolution of the military communications career field from one of operating the network to defending the network and ultimately to fighting the network. It has been an epic transformation. Today, that transformation has been enhanced by the acknowledgement of space and cyber as warfighting domains. And it has been enhanced by the establishment of the United States Space Force and Space Operations Command or SPOC the organization I have the privilege to command. You can even see how cyber is being elevated by US Space Force in that cyber operations has been designated one of our seven space power disciplines as codified in our service doctrine. And it's been enhanced further still by the establishment within Space Operations Command 
of Space Delta-6, our Cyber Warfighting Operations Unit. Del-6, as we call it coll colloquially, continues to build on the Cyber Warfighting Foundation built over the last several decades. It's a mission-specific organization focused on cyber operations within SPOC. Del-6 operations encompass the entirety of the comm cyber evolution. These cyber guardians and airmen operate SPOC mission networks, defend those networks, and are prepared to take those networks into the fight when called. Del-6 protects and defends our space assets while ensuring uninterrupted communication from the operator to our on-orbit assets. To form a more cohesive partnership with space operators, Del-6 has successfully operationalized that operate, defend, fight imperative through an innovative cutting edge concept known as mission defense teams or MDTs. Of course, the Air Force has been working on the N MDT concept for the past five to seven years or so, but its application to a developing and evolving US Space Force offers the perfect opportunity to apply it and realize the full potential of the MDT concept in a, in a new operating domain. The US Space Force and SPOC are operationalizing our vision on what cyber dominance is, what it requires to be effective, and how we'll employ it at the operational and tactical levels of space warfighting. It's very much like how we historically employed cavalry units, mobile, agile, and sometimes furtive in reconnaissance, screening and skirmishing, but with rapid power when the situation called for decisive, overwhelming engagement. Our cyber forces are on the leading edge of our weapon systems, performing recon and screening our forces from threats. But when required, they can repulse those threats as well. Now, each of our mission defense teams is dedicated to protecting and defending a specific space weapon system enhancing spot combat power and posturing our forces for space superiority at the time and place of our choosing. No doubt, the cyber guardians and airmen who make up our MDTs are space warfighters using cyber infrastructure to achieve space and cyber warfighting objectives. And we have a lot of outstanding guardians and airmen accomplishing those warfighting objectives for us. During my travels to visit the various mission deltas, I've had the chance to meet with many of those outstanding guardians and airmen. Take Rob Fish, for example. He's an amazing guardian and first lieutenant at the front lines protecting and defending our space capabilities. Rob found his passion for cyber at Colorado State University in the computer science program. When he's not on console at work, he's either out walking his German Shepherd, skiing or on another type of console as a gamer playing League of Legends. It was absolutely the right move for the Air Force to select him to be a part of the cyber career field and then to approve his transfer into the United States Space Force. His introduction to the space community came with his first assignment at Buckley, where he landed the opportunity to work in the former 460th Space Communication Squadron, now the 62nd Cyber Squadron. The talent Rob showed early on got him a spot on their newly formed mission defense team supporting the nation's missile warning capability. That nexus of cyber and space came to life at this point in Rob's career. It was here where we get to see a great example of why cyber and the work of our MDTs uh, performed on a daily basis are so crucial. Back in December of 2020, Lieutenant Fish and his crew were tasked to respond to the solar wind cyber hack, which affected a variety of sectors worldwide. The team investigated worked with the intelligence community and provided assistance in mitigating the risk posed by the breach. One of their major actions included the planning and execution of a hunt mission to find indicators of compromise within their defended mission system. They were able to determine that the protected enclaves within the missile warning enterprise had not been compromised, providing mission assurance to their mission owner. The only way we as a nation and a force will combat these types of events is through members like Rob, professionals who clearly display a sense of pride and ownership in their duty. Rob isn't just a team of one, he is surrounded by others who also exhibit the characteristics we admire and the warfighting capabilities we need. In fact, the level of teaming between the mission defense team at Buckley and the space operators in Space Delta IV 
who operate the space-based infrared system or SIBRS is unlike anything I've ever seen. Rob and his team of cyber guardians speak SIBRS as well as the operators who fly and operate those nationally critical satellites. And they have no bigger proponents than Colonel Rich Borkwin and the entire Delta IV leadership team. Now, if you travel south from Buckley, you will come to Schriever Air Force Base, where our satellite control network and global positioning system squadrons are located. It is essential that we in the Space Force also have mission defense teams attached to such important weapon systems. We rely heavily on guardians like Dominic Cuervo from New Jersey, who is a specialist for or spec for working as a MDT operator supporting the satellite control network. Dominic is another one of our all-star all cyber guardians who is working towards a college degree while also staying in shape with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He is both a New York Giants and Mets fan, and like many others, decided to join the armed forces to open his aperture and broaden his horizons. We are glad to have him as part of the Space Force team. He, like Lieutenant Fish, was identified early on by his instructors to be selected to join a mission defense team. Recently, Spec4 Cuervo was hand selected to participate in an exercise known as Vigilant Eagle, where multiple MDTs are hunting down and, el and eliminating advanced persistent threats or APTs from their networks. Dominic and his six person team competed against five other teams from across the Department of the Air Force. In the end, their attention to detail and passion for the job allowed them to locate, engage, and eliminate every threat they faced. The Secretary of the Air Force recognized their achievement and the Secretary even personally coined Spec4 Cuervo for a job well done. As new members of the Space Force, I am envious of the experiences that guardians like Lieutenant Fish and Spec4 Cuervo will have awaiting them. We see a future in which US Space Force cyber guardians not only operate the best mission defense teams in the Department of Defense, but also have the opportunity to serve in cyber protection teams and in offensive cyber operation teams. Now there is still much work to do to make that vision a reality, but that is where we are headed in our new young service. And I know both Lieutenant Fish and Specialist Cuervo will be on the cutting edge of our ability to achieve and preserve cyber dominance. Oh, to be young again, Across the board, I have full confidence that the guardians and airmen who work in our space enterprise will continue to break barriers. In fact, that kind of innovation is exactly what the Chief of Space Operations, General Jay Raymond, demands of members of the US Space Force. Cyber has become a proving ground for that very innovation. With the revolutionary progress we experienced over the last several decades, what is past has been and is prologue indeed. But the epilogues are far from being written. We will fast forward to the future with outstanding, guard, outstanding guardians like Rob and Dominic. Rest assured, they're paving the way for the future, decades hence. Thank you again for the chance to join you all today. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Simper Supra. Well, thank you very much, uh, General Whiting. And uh, it was wonderful hearing uh, uh, your description of uh, uh, the evolution, uh, frankly, of uh, where we both started uh, in, in communications uh, and how it has evolved uh, now uh, into uh, space areas uh, and cyberspace uh, domains. And, and I might uh, just mention the fact that America's Future Series you notice that we have uh, coined the phrase class uh, in all capitals. Uh, and, and that's because we recognize the fact of uh, cyber, uh, land, air, sea, and space. And frankly, when I started uh, in this business, it was uh, air, land, sea. Uh, and then uh, in the time that uh, General Whiting and I have been on active duty, uh, frankly, uh, we've added the, what we call the fourth domain, that being space, which is where he works uh, today. Uh, and also we've added now what we're referring to as uh, the fifth domain, which is cyberspace. So 
clearly. Uh, General Whiting, your, uh, first off, kind words uh, about my background and our experience together, but also the evolution of where everything uh, has been and where it's uh, currently at, and also some insights into where it's going. Uh, and, and let me just say uh, very quickly that General Whiting has agreed to take uh, questions uh, uh, from our audience. So you can type those in uh, and uh, they will come to me uh, in some way. Uh, I think Michelle or David will have uh, some sort of access to those, but we're opening it up. General Whiting has been uh, nice enough to, uh, to open up to uh, questions uh, during this, uh, this session today. But let me just say uh, that I'm reminded, uh, frankly, uh, with General Whiting, uh, that the best commanders and leaders, uh, whether they're in government or industry, are the ones who respect and recognize those people who work with them. And we've just witnessed one of those exceptional leaders and the introductions that General Whiting has given uh, to us of several of his uh, superstars who he has the the, the benefit uh, and of, of working with. Uh, again, I think it's uh, it's good to foot stomp uh, occasionally the basics of leadership, uh, and you've just witnessed that with General Whiting's presentation uh, and also uh, his recognition of those exceptional performers uh, that he's privileged to lead. Well, I'll wait for any questions to come in uh, from the audience. And we have a large audience, uh, I notice. Uh, over 500 people have, uh, are, are still with us here today. But uh, General Whiting, let me just, let me start off with a, with a question. It came to me, uh, frankly, as I was doing the introduction. Um, and I wonder if you couldn't just describe to us the difference between the U.S. Space Force uh, and the U.S. Space Command, because sometimes there are uh, uh, people get confused over uh, what those two different uh, organizations uh, are responsible for. So I'll turn that over to you as my first question. Yeah, thank you for that. And I really appreciate you raising it because it does inject confusion because we have all these organizations with the term space. Some of them also have the word command in them and then we jumble some other words in and it can be hard to keep these clear. So let me start with US Space Force, which again, my organization SPOC or Space Operations Command is a part of. We are the nation's sixth armed force. And according to federal law, the armed forces exist to organize, train and equip forces that then are handed over to other organizations to be employed. And I know for those who don't spend a lot of time around the military, that can sound strange because we think, oh, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and now the Space Force, they fight our nation's wars. Where the, their people do and their units do, but those as institutions actually do not. That get, gets handed over to something called a combatant command or a joint command. Again, under federal law, it's those organizations that employ the force or are the ones who lead us in our operations. So that's what US Space Command is. It is the combatant command for space. General Jim Dickinson, who is actually an army officer, is the combatant commander for space. And he has elements from all of the services which support him. But this pairing of a service who's dedicated to space with a combatant command that's dedicated, de dedicated to space is truly unique in the Department of Defense. And so I think today my command contributes to General Dickinson and US Space Command, probably about 85% of the capability uh, that, that he has to execute his missions. And that will actually grow a little bit over time as some uh, space organizations that are currently in the Navy and the Army uh, will transfer into the Space Force in the, in the next couple of years. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, uh, General Radigi. Two different organizations, but certainly symbiotic and related. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate that, uh, that explanation because uh, even in uh, doing the introduction uh, that, I, that I performed here today, uh, I noticed that uh, you know, you're the commander of the Space Operations Command of the US Space Force, as you've just uh, 
outlined again, uh, but you're all, you also serve as the U.S. Space Force service component to the U.S. Space Command. So uh, uh, again, as you mentioned, uh, we have a lot of organizations now, a lot of them have been created within the last year or two that have space in them. So uh, as we become more familiar with uh, the breakouts, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, key points that every, everyone needs to be uh, familiar with. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, a second question uh, that's, uh, that's on my mind, frankly, uh, and it gets to the, the foundational elements of the U.S. Space Force. Um, and, and as you look at the U.S. Space Force and all the different dimensions that it, it's into, um, can, can you just describe a little bit in basic terms all the different functions, organizations, and everything that you're aligned with, uh, and and the exciting future that, uh, and frankly, unique future for our government, for our Department of Defense, uh, that the U.S. Space Force uh, fulfills for us, and in going into the future. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, of course, the Space Force has grown out of the United States Air Force, and the United States Air Force built the world's best military uh, space capabilities, but the nation has come to the conclusion that we need an armed force totally focused 100% of the time on the space domain. And, and that's, that's operating in that domain, it's organizing units to be prepared to operate in that domain, and it's equipping, providing the capability in that domain without any distraction of, of any other domains. And so that means we can, we can bring in our, our own people that we're going to call guardians now, and we can grow them across a 20 or 30 or 40 year career with a sole focus on space. Now, some of those guardians will be intelligence professionals who will spend the majority of their career focused on the intelligence aspects, but they will be space warfighters. Some will be cyber guardians who will be focused on extending space power through the, the cyber domain, but at their heart, they're going to be space warfighters. And then we'll have operators who will be, uh, who will be skilled at, at commanding and controlling our systems in space. We'll have acquirers, and we will also have uh, engineers who will help us develop this capability. But that's the real opportunity here is having an organization solely focused on building the, the people, which will be the secret sauce of the Space Force, the guardians, and then building the capability. Uh, today, that will be uh, largely focused on, in fact, almost exclusively focused on uh, ensuring that we enable terrestrial operations and integrate with terrestrial operations to, uh, to help America uh, secure our interests um, in the terrestrial domain. But over time, as we think about uh, economic uh, opportunities out at the moon and beyond, uh, you know, I definitely foresee a future in which the Space Force uh, may very well have uh, manned uh, spaceflight, men and women on orbit, uh, conducting military operations to help defend those lanes of commerce as we extend out into the solar system. So uh, as General Raymond likes to say, we have stood up a new service in the last 16 months, but we are building a force uh, for 100 years from now as well. And, and that's the kind of timescale we have to be thinking about when we talk about the opportunity of what Space Force is. Great, great. Super explanation. Uh, let, me, um, let me ask one other uh, question here. Um, and, and that comes to us, uh, you know, as far as uh, the relationship of U.S. Space Force uh, with industry. Uh, with your industry partners and all the individuals that you're, you're teamed with. Um, can, can you give us some ideas of some, perhaps maybe some of the best uh, innovation that you've seen uh, coming from uh, industry uh, uh, into, the, into the new U.S. Space Force and your command? Uh, and also maybe some of the uh, innovation that uh, you would hope to uh, see uh, in the future. Over. Yeah, of course, the United States is blessed to have uh, the world's best aerospace companies uh, that, that have been doing this with us for decades. Uh, but we've gotten better and there's been a, just an incredible amount of innovation in the space uh, domain in the last decade. In fact, I talk about this time period. And it's not unique to me, but uh, this is the second golden age of space. 
I was a child when uh, Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the moon. I was a, a, only two or one and a half. So I don't remember that. Although I do remember laying in the back of, uh, of my parents' uh, uh, vehicle. And, and, you know, that was back in the days before kids, I guess, had to be uh, belted in. But laying in the back, looking up at the moon and having my parents in the early 70s tell me that there was an Apollo, you know, astronaut on the moon at that point. So it must have been like 72 or 73. Uh, but but now the, that level of excitement is here again because of this innovation that we've seen. Uh, and so we are excited about both what the traditional uh, companies that have brought us so far and done so much for us, but also a lot of new uh, rapid startup com companies. Uh, you know, it's great that we have a lot of, uh, of uh, tech billionaires who are interested in space and are investing their own uh, money into space, but we also see a lot of small startups and, and where I really see a lot of innovation opportunity is not only, uh, well, two places. One is on orbit, uh, as we've seen a whole new class of satellite form factors. Instead of building satellites that are the size of, of buses, uh, you know, we're now seeing a proliferation of constellations with much smaller, cheaper form factors. I think that gives us a real opportunity to think about our constellations differently. Uh, but then also here on terra firma, the, uh, the rapid software innovation that we are seeing uh, now with, with uh, development uh, uh, methodologies like DevSecOps, where we pair developers with operators with a secure software foundry, and we can very rapidly get after developing software that solves real problems for our operators. We're starting to see that pay off as well. And uh, that really uh, opens our young guardian and airman's eyes about, hey, my voice is being heard. This is not a five-year requirements process that has to go to the Pentagon and then another five to seven-year acquisition process that then delivers me something. I'm sitting right here with the coder. I give her or him feedback and tomorrow she or, him, she or he delivers me a new software capability. And so really excited about that uh, opportunity. And we're seeing that from a number of new uh, startups as well as some of the traditional companies as well. That's great. Well, uh, you bring up uh, the fact that uh, you recall Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Uh, I have a few years on you, uh, General Whiting, and uh, I can remember uh, that I was at uh, a military boot camp at that time. Uh, and uh, in the evenings, you know, we uh, had lots of duties because they never let you rest, but uh, they actually turned on a television. Uh, in our barracks area and allowed us to witness uh, the walking on the moon. And uh, however, uh, because we were uh, supposed to be at least multitask at that time, uh, we were all shining our boots uh, a little bit, uh, looking down at the spit shine boots, uh, but also up to history uh, being made uh, with Neil Armstrong. So uh, I wonder if uh, uh, we have a question here about workforce development. And uh, I wonder, uh, you've got so many different uh, professionals that, that actually form your area uh, within the US Space Force uh, and beyond. But uh, can you give us your thoughts right now on, on workforce development, what you see uh, happening now, uh, and perhaps the areas that we really need to put uh, extra emphasis uh, as, as you build the U.S. Space Force uh, into the future? Yeah, thanks for that question. And a couple comments uh, related to our military personnel and then our civilian uh, personnel, uh, which may also extend into the contractor workforce. But the scale of the U.S. Space Force is just different than the other services. You know, the U.S. Air Force is somewhere around 325,000. Uh, I've lost the bubble exactly, but it's something like that. Um, and, and they have to assess tens of thousands of, of young enlisted uh, members and officers every year. Uh, the Space Force is, is much, much smaller than that. Uh, this year, we will assess under a thousand of, of those uh, enlisted and officers combined. We think that gives us a chance to be incredibly selective in who we go to bring in. And, and in any way you can think about that, we can bring in uh, you know, uh, the most talented, we can bring in a, a, a very diverse workforce and we're excited about that opportunity and it changes as well uh, how we think about recruiting instead of having to, uh, you know, get uh, maybe 60,000 young men and women to, to talk to us to find the 40,000 who we need to bring in, we can go headhunt the several hundred that we want to bring in perhaps 
you know, if we find out that Sally just won a state level or national level robotics competition or a cyber competition, uh, we can figure that out through, uh, you know, through uh, means where, where young people are posting these things on social media and we can go find Sally and go talk to her directly before she ever calls us. We go tell her, hey, we, we, we've got an opportunity for you in the U.S. Space Force. So we think we can be very selective. But then we're also working today with the Air Force because we're continuing to leverage those Air Force schools like basic military training at Lackland, starting to put in space specific content into those schools. But over time, we do think it's a core responsibility of a service to develop your own people. So at some point, we, as we continue to, to mature, uh, we, will, we will stand up our own courses and, from foundational training courses all the way up to professional military education. So we can focus uh, that uh, training and education experience on the space domain. Uh, what we like to say is we're going to build joint smart space professionals or guardians, and then we want to help the rest of the joint force be space smart as well. Now on our civilian side, um, you know, I recently had the chance to participate uh, in a uh, event at the Air Force Academy with Congressman Lamborn, uh, you know, where the local community here on the front range was talking about how do we scale up our ability to, to develop a, a robust technical space uh, workforce. And we're certainly supportive of those efforts. We are utterly reliant on our uh, civilian uh, government employees. They are foundational to all of our, all aspects of our mission. And so we're, we're uh, eager to see those type of uh, efforts move forward. And of course, we're, we're blessed here in Colorado where most of our tactical operations are, and of course my headquarters, that there is this very sophisticated uh, work uh, force. But I know there's never enough of those uh, type people. So we're supportive of those efforts. And, um, and, and maybe that got after uh, some of the question, but happy to take a follow-up, General Radke, if you need to yeah, thank you very much. Well, you know, uh, you've mentioned uh, a couple of times uh, the United States Air Force Academy uh, and knowing that you're a graduate there. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of our audience uh, watched with great interest uh, the graduation ceremony uh, this last year. And I think some of the things that we all noticed was that uh, there was a cadre of people uh, who were graduating from the uh, Air Force Academy that seemed to have a different uniform or designation to them. Uh, it was a smaller number, but I think at that time, uh, and when you talk about evolution, I, I think at that time, the US Space Force only had like two people uh, that were officially uh, uh, part of the, or assigned officially to the US Space Force. But can you, Give us your impressions as you watch your alma mater uh, graduate some uh, some new folks and some of the differences you saw in that and perhaps uh, as as an extension of that uh, where you see the uh, the numbers of the space force today growing from two not too long ago up to what you have now and maybe where those forces came from and where you're expecting additional uh, people power, if you will, to come from in the future? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, the, uh, we've been very blessed that uh, we have fantastic leaders at the Air Force Academy. A former boss of mine retired out as the superintendent last year, Lieutenant General Jay Silveria, and now we have Lieutenant General Rich Clark, and, and both of their staffs have just been phenomenal. The Air Force Academy will be the service academy for the Space Force, much like the United States Naval Academy or Annapolis, as we, we call it, commissions officers both into the Navy and the Marine Corps and has for, you know, since the uh, 1840s, I think. Um, the Air Force Academy will be the service academy for the Space Force. And as you highlighted last April in that very unusual graduation that was COVID compliant, um, they did commission, I think it was 84 graduates into the Air Force Academy. And as you said, at that point, the only two members who had formally transferred into the Space Force were General Raymond and uh, Chief Toberman, our Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force. Um, and then I, I sat there as an Air Force officer assigned to the Space Force because my, my unit was part of the Space Force, but I was still an airman, very jealous of those 84 <laughs> lieutenants, to be perfectly honest. Um, but this year, I think that number is going to be about 116. Now, the Air Force Academy typically graduates 1,000 cadets a year, right around 1,000. So you take the average of 84 and 116, that's somewhere around 100. And to me, that's a really exciting number. 10% of, of each graduating class 
will become Space Force officers. Um, and, and by the way, as I mentioned, General Clark and General Severia before, they are just thinking about all sorts of ways to infuse uh, space at the Air Force Academy. Of course, it's not like it wasn't there. They, they have a, a national world leading Department of Astronautics and, uh, and they have all sorts of cool things. Cadets can fly satellites and be a part of a, a satellite operations squadron, but they're just thinking about now how to even take that to the next level. And we've assigned a Colonel at the Air Force Academy uh, who, is, who is our liaison there full time working with the Academy staff uh, to execute those kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of issues. And of course we'll have, we'll have Space Force members on the faculty. We'll have Space Force members who are in Air, Air Officer Commandings who help run the cadet squadrons and so excited about that. Um, you know, we'll continue to see how we grow uh, going forward. I think right now the number we typically use of, of military and civilian is about 16,000 General Radege. And, uh, and then we'll have thousands of airmen who continue to support us. So if you drive to Peterson Air Force Base today or you go to Patrick Space Force Base, um, the, the military individuals who are securing the gate, who are operating the clinic, uh, who are... Uh, running the fuel out to the flight line, all of those are airmen and they will continue to be airmen, but they'll be assigned to units which are a part of the Space Force. So it's a very interesting arrangement. There's some similarities to how the Navy provides corpsmen and doctors and chaplains to the Marine Corps. Um, so we'll just continue to be tightly partnered with the US Air Force as we move forward. Great answer, I really appreciate that. And the fact that uh... U.S. Space Force in just such a short time uh, has grown from two people uh, to, as you mentioned, over 16,000 uh, and growing. And then, of course, with all of your reach out into the into the contractor world and the participants uh, uh, and all of the other sponsors and and uh, uh, partners that you have, it, it truly is a very exciting uh, time on the workforce uh, front. Um, let me uh, let me ask what. Uh, Another question that has come in, um, how do you, uh, with the U.S. Space Force, how do you work uh, with the U.S. Cyber Command? Since we're talking here today about uh, cybersecurity in space, it seems like a perfect uh, type of uh, opportunity to describe, you know, who are, how our premier uh, Space Force and how our nation's U.S. Cyber Command work together on a daily basis? Yeah, thanks for that question. We're very fortunate to have a, an incredible teammate in Lieutenant General Tim Hawk, who is the commander of uh, the Air Force Cyber Component, also known as 16th Air Force. And uh, we're deeply partnered with him and his team on our uh, vision for moving forward on, on cyber. And of course, he works for General Nakasone and US Cyber Command. Um, and, and so at, I, I talked briefly in my remarks about this vision of how we'll continue to build out our mission defense teams. But as we move beyond that and, and think about building out cyber protection teams or per, perhaps even offensive capability, those latter two areas will have to be completely partnered with U.S. Cyber Command. They are the combatant command for those kind of forces. Um, and we do, uh, of course, get uh, great support and uh, have a good relationship with General Nakasone and his team. Uh, right now, that's primarily through U.S. Space Command through the joint side. Uh, but as we continue to evolve our cyber capabilities, I think we'll have uh, likely a more direct relationship uh, with U.S. Cybercom. Of course, a lot of decisions have to be made before we get to that point, but that's the vision of where we're trying to get to. That's great. That's great. Um, I noticed that uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit right now uh, because one of the questions that came in uh, is your answer is going to be viewed by over 630 people that we have live with us here right now. So uh, I'm sorry to do this to you, General Whiting, but the question is, uh, are you planning to uh, attend the Space Symposium uh, in August, which, uh, of course, is the annual event here in Colorado Springs? Uh, and that Space Symposium, of course, over the years has supported uh, and, and had thousands of people participating. But uh, I, I guess we have someone out there uh, in video land or cyberspace right now that wants to know if you're planning to participate uh, in that 
that event, which will be hybrid from what I understand. So lots of other folks uh, can, can actually listen to the presentations and participate uh, you know, from distant locations, but there will be uh, quite a large cadre of people here at the Broadmoor Hotel. But uh, uh, can you commit to that at this particular time uh, for that August event? Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, just last week, I got a very kind invitation from the Space Foundation asking me to speak in some capacity. Uh, that'll still be determined exactly uh, where, when, what that'll look like, but I was very uh, grateful to receive that invitation and really, really hopeful that we can have some element of an in-person uh, event, you know, and hopefully the, the trends continue to look positive on the COVID front so that we can have uh, at least some aspect of that be in person because it is such a phenomenal event. You know, you, you, you pair the event with the venue in this beautiful city, it uh, really can't be beat. And so uh, looking forward to getting the space community back together, uh, hopefully in that, in that venue and having a chance to speak and, and hear from, uh, you know, uh, many, many other uh, great folks. Well, uh, I wanna thank you for the time you have spent with us here today. Uh, your comments uh, and insights uh, have been uh, truly insightful and remarkable. Uh, it has been my pleasure to work with you uh, over the years, uh, and I think you gave a perfect answer, frankly, to uh, the Space Foundation and uh, to all of us, frankly, out there who participate every year in that space symposium, which is, which is such a remarkable uh, event. So, uh, General Whiting, thank you so much. It's great to uh, have had this uh, chat with you. It's great to have heard your words and thank you again uh, for being such a great commander and such a great leader. Uh, you're the perfect person at the perfect time uh, as, as the US Space Force continues to develop uh, and meet the needs of our nation uh, and beyond. So thank you very much. Hey, uh, thank you, General Radigi, and thanks uh, to the America's uh, Future Series for for inviting me and for the interest in uh, Space Force. It's, uh, it's a vital institution for the nation, young, no doubt, but, uh, but we're building this uh, to make sure that America's interests in outer space are, are taken care of and so that we can continue to enjoy all the benefits we derive from space today. But, but thinking about the future, that, that we are not limited and how our nation can take advantage of that, uh, of that unlimited potential that space brings to us. So thank you to all. I gotta ask you just one last thing. The United States uh, Marine Corps is known for yelling out Semper Fi. What's the U.S. Space Force yell? Yeah, we're working that. Maybe it should be go for launch. <laughs> Semper Supra. Yeah, that too. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, it is Semper Supra. That's right. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, and I'll turn it over to uh, headquarters for the America's Future Series. Uh, with uh, Scott Murray and uh, David Hamilton. Over to you. That sounds so official. Headquarters, huh? <laughs> Worldwide intergalactic headquarters. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. He's great. So Thank I voted so for much. Excelsior like uh, Stan Lee used to yell. Oh, okay. Yeah, for, whatever, the, for the Space Force. So they didn't pick up Excelsior. They went with nope. whatever works. Semper Supra. <laughs> well, once again, that was great, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Absolutely. Yeah, it Thanks really was. Harry. Yeah, and uh, it's just... Uh, Continuing on, we're, we're heading down the home stretch, my friend. We are getting pretty close. Yeah, that was a great keynote by, uh, by, by oh, General Whitting. Phenomenal. Whiting, if I'm saying correctly. Phenomenal. It's fantastic yeah. to have him. We want to thank him. We know he's very busy, and all these senior yeah. leaders are. And for them to take time out of their day and, and devote that to share their messages with our audience is really. Well, it's funny important. you say that, David, because every time I see one of these pop up, and if I've not looked at my notes to see who's coming up next, I go, oh my gosh, is he here today? Yeah. I'm going, whoa. It's a great, great lineup. Yeah, it is a good lineup.